when I became a member of parliament, we had a Commonwealth Parliamentary Conference in Bermuda, and I met some uh, MPs from the UK. And they asked me, what business are you in? I said, I'm a plumber. They said, yeah, you know something? I said, uh, an old MP in England told me one time, if you can plumb, you can pretty well do anything. <laughs> so I never forgot that. I can remember when the Technical Institute was built, I think, I think it opened around 1956, if my memory serves me right. And it was like the railway, it didn't last very long. 16 years and it was gone, which was very unfortunate, because they turned out some actual students. I was a member of parliament when they, in 1972, I think, when they decided to close the tap. And, and, and the PLP, we fought very vigorously to stop them from closing. But I must admit, they had, they had us over a barrel to a certain degree because the enrollment had started to decrease. And that's the reason, they didn't give it a chance, too much of a chance. And, and that's the reason why they decided to combine it with the Bermuda College. But in combining with Bermuda College, they have the trades at Bermuda College. But what is different from the Bermuda Technical Institute? The Bermuda College takes the older boys. The Technical Institute took the boys right out of elementary school disease. And that made a difference. You caught those boys when they were 12, 13 years old, and taught and started to teach them a trade. And they felt important. They felt like, you know, they belong. So they were very important. And this made a difference. And we, a lot of times uh, we don't realize that until we, things have passed and, 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 uh, and these uh, incidents start to occur. I see that uh, it is time now to reinvent the Technical Institute. And I would like, I would like to see a committee get together to start working with the government to bring back technical education in Bermuda. It shouldn't be very difficult at this particular time because government have a lot of vacant buildings around Bermuda which could very easily be used for a technical institute. They need a bit, they need some of them need a bit of fixing up and some equipment put in there, put, put there. But it shouldn't be any major, it shouldn't be a real major project um, I don't know too much about the curriculum at the Technical Institute, Institute because, I, because I didn't attend, it was, came after my time really. But uh, I, I, I'm sure that the gentlemen that attended the Tech, tech uh, they could very easily put together a curriculum. And nowadays, uh, the computers and IT and the rest of the stuff are all so important. I know they'd be involved in an institution like that. So when these kids, or when these children, men, young men, finish, um, the Technical Institute at 18 years old, 17, 18, 19 years old, they, they'll be prepared to go into society and make a valuable contri contribution to society. So I'm only hoping that, that the impetus that started now and these young uh, former tax students, former committee, get together with government and get, uh, and, and, and get the um, and get tax started. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Burroughs. Our next speaker, David J. Sullivan. I'll go again, David. David J. Sullivan, punctuated, is a Bermudian, was born in Brooklyn, New York. I won't give the birth date to David. He received his elementary and secondary education in the United States in 71. He attended the Bermuda College, Department of Hotel Technology. He completed his studies in hotel management, certifying in city and guilds, and the American Hotel and Motel Management Association. He was employed in the local industry until August of 75. During his time, he also served as an instructor at the Bermuda College. He joined American International Company Limited, working in their international reinsurance reporting division as account supervisor. 
In 79, he joined the Gulf Oil Corporation as a project account and accountant for Insco Limited Gulf's captive insurance subsidiary. In 81, he was appointed Director of Administration. In 82, he was appointed Assistant Secretary for all companies operated from Bermuda. Uh, David, I'll stop there because we want to leave time for the speeches. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we present David Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. I'm certainly not as old as the uh, previous speaker, but on occasions like this, I kind of feel as old as the previous speaker. Uh, Rick uh, quickly points out to you that I'm not a graduate of the Tech. I was the fellow who was up the hill from the Tech at what was then called the Bermuda Hotel School. And in my second year of uh, being a student there, the Honorable Gloria McPhee, Minister of Education, decided that we would have the demise, if you will, of the Bermuda College, of the, uh, the tech area, and the creation of the Bermuda College, Department of Hotel Technology, Department of Academic Studies, and so on and so on. A reflection, if you will, of the, of the pressures of what Bermudians wanted at the time. Uh, the, the, there was a growing pattern of, of us looking further afield for what we thought the next generation of Bermudians could do and should be entitled to, to be able to compete on a global and world basis. The fact that Cornell University existed and had existed for a number of years, uh, where there was still the dream that Bermuda could have its own sort of Cornell University and plans were then set afoot to do away with the Bermuda College uh, or the Bermuda Hotel School as it was known in those days. And for those of you who may have passed through it for one reason or another, it was under the auspices of Neil Hansford Smith, and it had the IHMCA, it had the City and Guilds, it had all of the related subjects that one needed in the hospitality industry. Uh, but it didn't have its own hotel. It didn't have its own actual practice. It, didn't it, was, it wasn't able to compete with the various institutions that were growing in the outside world. So for whatever reason, and, and judgments were made, and, and, and therefore undertaken, the Bermuda College started to create itself, Department of Hotel Studies, Department of Academic Services, Department of so on and so forth. And we then merged our way through uh, another 20 or 30 years, probably 20 at best, taking us almost 10 years to get, get going in pageant, as I, as I would say, uh, to create an institution, specifically in the hotel industry, that basically was a day late and a dollar short. The, uh, the population that was coming through in 1972 to 79, had already passed through. And the demand for a hotel institution, a hotel education institution, specifically with a hotel attached, was ostensibly obsolete. And by the time we opened up the campus in Paget with the hotel training school called Stonington, many of you will, will be familiar with that name, we were actually at a point that we had to import students to put them through the education institute because Bermuda's population of students had already passed through. Uh, similar to a comment that Reg just made a moment ago by the time Tech came around, it was too late for him. But what did it, what did it do for, for an individual such as myself? It gave one, certainly during the days of the Bermuda Hotel School, the Bermuda Department of Hotel Technology in its early years, it gave one the basics and the fundamentals of what the business was all about. Who was our, and what was our training ground? Our training ground was Bermuda. We didn't have to rely upon a Stonington Beach operation. We got employment at Long Beach, we got employment at Pink Beach, we got employment at Castle Harbor, we got employment wherever uh, the industry would require us. And in fact, it was part of our training. And, and I always uh, tell my grandchildren now, but my children when they were growing up, that one of the most valuable name badges I ever had in the industry was my name badge that said, David Sullivan, trainee. And the tourists would say to me, what does that mean? And I then went to my, my rap. <laughs> well, I'm a student at the hotel school, and you know, I'm not trying to learn the hotel business, and that sort of thing. Oh, you're such a wonderful guy. Here's 20 bucks. <laughs> Here's 20 bucks. So, I mean, I kept that name badge, and I still have it to this day, just in case things go south for me. <laughs> I want to use the trainee aspect again. So there was great support. I guess my point there is that there was great support, not only for us as students within Bermuda, but the tourism industry and so forth. And indeed, there was a tourism industry. Hey, there was a tourism industry. Uh, we have been through, I believe, my last count was something like 98 properties have closed. 
in the last 20 to 25 years in Bermuda. Now, did they close because they were economic failures? Did they close because we didn't have the personnel? I mean, come up with any myriad of excuses you want. My humble estimation of all this is they closed because Bermuda became very successful. I can speak from a personal family point of view. Uh, I married into, quote unquote, a small hotel family. And uh, my father-in-law was made an offer, as they would say in the Godfather movie, that he couldn't refuse. He was made an offer on the real estate value of his properties. Not the operational value of whether the hotel would make a dime or not, but Bermuda's real estate value went north. And a lot of businesses were just basically oversold by their asset value, not their operational value. So a lot of our small guest houses and cottage colonies and so forth went the way of Bermuda's success to the detriment of its profession. Uh, I, I don't think that it would be a, a wild comment to say to you that if you ever drive through the parish of Warwick in particular and look at the density of <coughs> homes that are in that parish and have the same ability to drive through that same parish some 50 years ago without the density of the homes, you will know that the hospitality industry was the reason why those homes were built. So it satisfied us at a time in our economy when it was required. So where are we today? We're at a time where we still have a population of people who are needing some attention. They're not going to be the boardroom chairmen, they're not going to be the actuaries, they're not going to be the high-priced neurosurgeons, they're not going to be the heart surgeons, they're not going to be all those things that many, many Bermudians have not only aspired to, but have been successful at. We still have a population of people that need employment, and we still have a need within our society for skills to satisfy that employment need. And our experiment into trying to meld it into other institutions or to make it a sidebar to academia has not proven well for us. We need now to go back and relook at how it is we can make vocational professions honorable again. They are not servitude, they are of service to what the population requires. And if you think it's a weird thing to say. Think of this at two o'clock in the morning when your pump blows up, and unlike Reggie, you don't know a damn thing about plumbing. <laughs> the plumber became just as important as possibly the heart surgeon you might be later on in your life. I'm here to support the aspect that vocational training is an honorable profession. It has stood with me well for 400 some odd years. We need to get back there. Thank you. Many thanks, uh, David. Again, uh, some of you just joining us. Uh, it's a bit warm in here, to say the least, but it's a good cause, so we ask you to stick it out. So we're going to put the rose amongst the... I won't call you guys that. So nominated in 1984 by the National Education Association as a future outstanding teacher, Shornette Sumner has fulfilled her childhood dream, dream of being an educator for the past 32 years and has enjoyed every year of it, so she says, after spending 20 years in public education, the capacity of a primary, middle, and of course a high school teacher. Mentor to, to, to new teachers and principal at one of our local primary schools, Ms. Sumner realized her greatest childhood dream by opening her own school, Star Academy. She did this in 2004. Regrettably, her school fell prey to the economic downturn, and seven and a half years after successful operation, Star Academy closed in December 2011. Ms. Sumner has hosted her radio talk show, Generations, on Mix 106. She also enjoys writing and has self-published three poetry books. She also wrote a weekly opinion column in the Friday edition of the Bermuda Sun. In July 2002, Ms. Sumner founded the Etiquette Classes for Girls and is proud to report 
uh, to date, just over 300 young ladies have completed a program in the areas of self-esteem, self-presentation, and selflessness. Ms. Sumner is constantly sought out by many people for many things, whether for personal or public matters of interest. In her free time, which she readily admits she rarely has, Ms. Sumner enjoys socializing with close friends and, of course, taking getaway trips locally or overseas. Won't go further into that. In September 2012, Ms. Sumner began a new journey in her new role as Education Officer for the Department of Corrections, where she is responsible for the education programs for inmates in Westgate, the co-ed, and the prison farm. Ms. Sumner is the proud single mother to two sons, 29-year-old Ryan Purnell and 18-year-old Seth Sumner. Ms. Sumner, we would like for you to come forward and deliver what I believe will be a riveting riveting speech and we'll give you a little insight we'll give you a little insight as as we said she works within the corrections facility but as we all know now there are many very young men in that facility lifers they are expressing and we need to listen a bit many things what would have stopped them from going astray and again no taking away responsibility but we hear some things expressed to Ms. Sumner in their own words thank you good evening everyone Mr. Richardson asked me to be a part of this I never heard from him again, so I had no idea I was to prepare a speech. <laughs> but nonetheless, I've made a few notes of a few things that I want to say. Um, as he mentioned in my bio, I do love teaching. It, it's all I ever dreamed of doing. 32 years into this, I still love it. I absolutely love my job. I have people that will say to me from time to time, how on earth could you possibly be around those people, meaning the inmates? That's probably one of the worst things you can say to me. I love my job. I see great success. And I think there's one thing I want people to understand is that if that is your sentiment, most of them will be back out to live amongst us. So the question is, what do we do about it? Because locking them up, feeding them bread and water, and throwing away the key will not work. As much as I absolutely love my job as an educator, I'm extremely frustrated because over 32 years, I have not seen things get better. They have gotten progressively worse. It's very frustrating when I and people like me who are very, very passionate about what we do constantly have to deal with red tape and bureaucracy when many of us do have solutions. It is very frustrating, very frustrating. And I'm not here this evening to bash anyone in particular, but I will say this, that in some instances, those people who are responsible for change and have the power to make change need to move out of the way. It's just that simple. Being in a position year after year after year after year after year and watching things steadily going downhill, it really doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out what needs to happen. It breaks my heart as a teacher to recall 
A particular school that I worked at, which um, most educators knew at the time, was simply called the Dumping Ground. And there were a few of us who continuously spoke out about the manner in which these young people were being taught, particularly the males. And this group of us, we were called cynical, we were called complainers, we were called all sorts of things which didn't help us in our future years in the career. However, it breaks my heart that I have to stand here tonight and say to you that a large majority of those young boys that we were being cynical about and complaining about are now locked up. One in particular serving a double life sentence. You know, when you love your job and you're very passionate about these things, those types of stories hit to the heart. Because I knew what I was talking about then. It's very painful. Education takes place everywhere, every way, every day. Technical education, for whatever reason, becomes separate and apart. A lot of our talent is locked up. Our plumbers, our tradesmen. My dream would be to see all young offenders, especially those up to the age of 25, if incarcerated, to be actively engaged in technical education so that they come out with skills. I'm asking for the community support we are the solution to take these young men under our wings. It is not easy and it is a commitment. And it's a commitment for a very long time to take these young men and not judge them for what they've done, but to mentor them and show them the things that unfortunately they were not privy to in our system. In closing, I just want to share a personal story, and I wasn't going to share it, but I think this is necessary because it speaks to what I'm talking about when I talk about the community. I was very fortunate enough to be invited to a very big meeting about three years ago, and a gentleman got up and spoke very passionately about how a local company took him under their wings at the age of 15. And he talked about his 35 year career with this company from the age of 15. At the time, my 18 year old was 15. I approached this gentleman after the meeting and I said, listen, my son is 15, what are the chances? Within two to three weeks, my 15-year-old was hired under the wings of this gentleman. And I can tell you that for the last three summers, that has been his employment. I will be forever grateful to Vance Hollis for what he's done for my son. Because as I go to work every day and look in the eyes of these young men, I recognize that any of them could be my two sons. And I treat them accordingly. So we must do our part. We have to do our part because it's getting worse. Thank you. Just uh, before Ms. Sutton leaves, I, I need to ask you because I've heard it in another place. Um, without reading those letters, what, what did some of the young men communicate to you as to what would have assisted them as they came through without making excuses or using that as a reason for offending? Well, 
I think many of us have heard the saying before that hurt people hurt people, yes? And we make assumptions that when these heinous things are done, you know, somebody just woke up and decided to do it. Unfortunately, many of our young men who are hurting, and that also includes those that have not been incarcerated yet, many of our young men did not have the family unit. Many of them, therefore, didn't have the extended family. As some of you sit in this room today, you can tell stories about your mom, your dad, your granny, grandpa, and everybody. Some of them didn't have that. And in some cases where they did, it wasn't a pretty sight. So basically, we are now seeing the outcome. You know the poem, children live what they learn, yes? But I will tell you what the solution is. It's simple. <laughs> and, uh, you know, sometimes it, it just baffles me. I, I ask this question all the time. How come, like, simple things just become so complicated? And five years down the road, everybody's still talking about it. The solution is to talk to the perpetrators. It's simple. Just because you're locked up, it doesn't mean you're going away. We need to listen to people, and we need to listen to them tell us what they need. And until we do that, these types of forms will just keep on happening, and then the next time we hear of something bad that happens in Bermuda, we'll shake our head and we'll ask the question, when will this stop? Unfortunately, I'm starting to believe that there are just some people who just don't care. That's where I am right now. Thank you. Just uh, adding to that though, the fact that each of you have come out tonight to help us as the Bermuda Tech alums begin this process, not just with us, but with each of you. So it's good to see you, and we believe that you care. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to have on our panel tonight a giant of a man in the context of labor matters in these islands. One who really needs no introduction, but I will continue. As his presence here tonight is a testament to his dedication to the cause of the labor movement, also in training and an eye on the future. I dare call him this. Brother Ottawa Otti, as he's known, was president of the BIU during the height of the modern day movement, has been a labor man all of his life, continues to give back during his retirement. The Honorable Otti always stops to inquire of the everyday man just how he's doing. He has a genuine concern for the dignity and the well-being of all workers of all persuasions. He has occupied a seat in the Bermuda Parliament and has represented Labour globally at conferences at the highest levels, meeting with international Labour leaders and heads of state. We expect to hear his views on the current state of affairs and the job market and what he believes must happen to guide us through these challenging and trying times. I might say that I used to interview Adi and there, was, there were two things there. A bit of fear, never knew what he was going to say or how he was going to go about it, and much respect for the icon. The Honorable Otto Simmons. Thank you, uh, Rick. Good evening, everybody. And uh, lots of us in this room, we know each other. But what I want to know is who attended the Bermuda Technical Institute? Wow! Look at that. Look behind you. Hold your hands up, you guys. 
and girls. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, if we had time, you know, it would be nice to do a little survey here and say, what are you doing now? Are you still interested? Blah, blah, blah. If one asks for their interest, the thing that made them tradesmen, and I know, I know you, know, you guys know I know you, because a lot of you've been to the union, and then in the party, and, or whatever. What has built Bermuda is people with training. And that is what we are got to concentrate on here tonight. We had some of the best tradesmen. Abi, Reggie Boris, and his father and his grandfather. I started out with two little boys together, working for, with his grandfather. I learned the uh, trade of plumbing. And later in life, after being married, and a couple of kids, I went to the Technical Institute. And Mr. Crawford, and help me with the names, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Hughes, Sweet, and then you. Gishar, Carrie, Carrie. And, yeah. And those people, the, I, I was not a full-time student, I came night. I was driving a taxi and doing something else, working in the hotel, and I went to train. And after my term there, I was showing off with a piece of paper that said, you passed. So next time you see me, call me Mechanic Gotti. <laughs> and I, I was doing an um, automobile mechanic. I went to BAS, this is a nice story. I went to BAS and a man by the name of Mr. Tom Keel hired me. And when I went in, I wanted to be the maintenance man for the limousines that travel to the airport and the hotels. Mr. Keel interviewed me and he said, um, son, I heard what you had to say, but don't give up your taxi. I'm going to hire you, but don't give up your taxi. And there was a warning that I would be fired pretty soon. <laughs> but strangely enough, Mr. Keel and the rest of the management there, they took me and sent me on a training course specifically for the Volkswagen in Long Island City in New York. And I came back with one of those papers says, congratulations, you passed. You know what I mean? Now, today, it does not exist. And even when I was doing some mechanical work, I was never a master mechanic, don't think that, don't ask me to fix your car anymore. <laughs> um, Bobby D. Ritson, one of my best friends, one of my best friends, he's the late Bobby D. Ritson. Every time I got in trouble, I would run to Bobby D. And when I got in trouble with them plumbing, I run to RB. You know, and it's it's trade and uh, mechanical skills taught to you. It's vitally important to you, the individual, and it's critically important to the nation. I came here to make a brief speech, and I'm going to say now. Before we go here, from here tonight, somebody else has already said it, um, or hinted to it. I would like for us to decide tonight that we're going to have a committee of 11 or 12 people with, with um, ordinary working people on that committee as well as some of the people that can pick up brain. Um, <laughs> you know, because, and have a working group and let them go to work for three to six months interviewing people, looking at the history of the Bermuda Technical Institute, looking at the Bermuda College, which is supposed to have replaced the uh, Bermuda Technical Institute, and it's done a very poor job. I've been involved in training all over the place. Bermudians, have lost out a lot. 
When we were in the union at the negotiating table, one of the main things, apart from wages, that seemed like it was very important too, <laughs> but um, was training. And every collective agreement had made reference to training. And the employers got training. Uh, what's his name? Berlin. No, no Alan. Alan Berlin used to come at the BIU when I was there to build, not the building we're in, not one of the old buildings, you know. Alan come over there and push for training. And a lot of the guys that were around in the 70s and 80s uh, went as soon as the technical school, the um, hotel school opened, or the, the college. Um, these guys went over to train. Fellas, some of you here may have been, been trainers over there. So I would like to propose that before, Rick, the meeting is finished, we have a working group of a small group that would go to work once or twice a week on planning to open a technical institute. It is needed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ari. Now, we deliberately asked folks to keep speeches short so that we could get input from the audience. We have our, some of our tech alums there and we want to have them field some of the questions uh, in this segment before we go to our next segment. And I mentioned we have a young man, Roger Todd, coming up. We have Anthony Webb who will relate his experiences with the guys who are in the street. Those fellas who right now can't travel from Somerset to Hamilton, and those in St. George Anthony who can't come to town, and those in the country, we call the country, Rangers area, who can't move beyond. Anthony is dealing with these things on a weekly basis. We have to and we want to make you aware that it's not acceptable to have two young men gunned down inside of the space of a week. And I think our response tonight is indicative that we have numbers of people who want to do whatever we can to prevent this from escalating Putting the tech education in place, it's not going to be the panacea. But we must start somewhere. We must get those middle schoolers. We must move on that. So, we have a mic there. And uh, if you have a question or a comment so far, keep it brief. We do have um, the speakers still there. We have a panel of tech alums there. Again, if you are involved in a program, we may be aware of it. The general public may not be totally aware of it. Please come forward and make your comment brief, your question brief. From the floor. Audi is motioning to me. I did not learn sign language. Yes, sir. Yes. I'm really just asking for to be excused because I don't feel well. Um, I'm due to travel a long way to, uh, tomorrow, and I've been up all day. Not got that So you got me now? Can you hear me now? Good. No, as um, Mr. Simmons leaves, we want to give him a round of applause.
So we want, we want that straight talk. Adi goes there, and um, he's added something to our initiative. I see a young man in the audience there. We spoke the other night, and he told me of his endeavors to find work after getting skilled, and that too has led to some of the problems. Again, tonight, we don't want a bashing session of anybody. We want solutions, we want real talk, we want something that the tech group can build on, and we want to move forward. Yes? Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Carol Bassett. And um, I remember the staff meeting in which I sat when our principal, Dr. Marsh, read the letter that said, effective September whatever, do not send any more students to the Technical Institute. And we listened for reasons. We got none. And we were shocked. And um, I would say Bermuda had some recovery. I also have a tape where a certain government official said he closed the school because it was too successful. And that upset me more, and that was at a tech reunion. And I'm saying that the middle schools can't replace, I was a principal of a middle school, and a senior school, they cannot replace what the Technical Institute offered. They cannot. The DNT, we call it, we don't even have a budget for it. It's neither here nor there. So what I'm saying, I've been praying about this for years. Not just boys yes. going to the Technical Institute, because we know how girls going up to Rhode Island for technical education from Bermuda. We need any sex who is interested, guided, to have that quality education that my husband and all you guys had. Um, you were our competition when I was at Barbie. And you rode your bikes up there with stars. <laughs> I'm not going to say the reason you came. But <laughs> you were competition. You, you beat all our soccer games. You did. You're shy. You know what I mean? You walk with. I looked at you tonight. You have class. And what I'm saying is these kinds of values can help our children. I have three gang leaders, not always incarcerated, you see? And the mind, the owls, the owls. They don't like us when we go to college. When you come back summers, they check you out downtown. You can't even park and be safe. So bring back tech, the tech we knew and more. Thank you. I recognize the floor. Good evening. I will be brief. Uh, the gentleman on the stage is my brother. I only quote that because there seems to be a myth about that technical education and academia are separate. I lived with this guy from birth, and I can tell you he is an academic. Unfair. I can tell you that there were times when he would have us in the kitchen, around the table, and he talked. He is an academic, but he's also a very skilled technician. And the two are not mutually exclusive. So I think I, I, that's one myth I want to debunk tonight. We need to stop saying that we need to get our people who uh, can't think, and that's not what we're saying, but that's how it comes across, to use their hands. In terms of what I am doing, along with a group of people who were part of the um, SANS mentoring team, we have a group of students that we followed boys from middle school, M1. We have mentored them. We have uh, spent time with them, we have taken them on college tours, and we meet with them monthly and have been doing so over the past five years. And I'm happy to say that our young men have now reached S4, 
And this year is a critical year and we will continue to support them. We've watched them develop. We've watched them make their way. Some of them are in dual enrollment. Some of them have already graduated, even though they all started off out together. And some of them live in Gulfstream and they are struggling. That's all I'll say, thank you. Thanks much. Young men and young men, you can line up. Yes, good evening everyone. I myself is a product of technical training. I didn't, I'm too young to go technical institute as his name, but the facility, the building up on Roberts Avenue, I did attend that in 1982. And I just want to say, you asked for short and long, you asked for solutions. I just want to just share just a few solutions. Short, short and mid and long term, long -term. solutions. Um, short term solutions. When I happen to, I call this place Home Depot, that's Times Bay Incinerator on Palmetto Road and also at the airport, happen to go to both facilities from time to time. And the amount of waste as a society, the amount of waste, air conditioning units, cycles, dehumidifiers, televisions, computers, you, you name it. Um, it. It hurts me. And when I see the, what happens, especially our young males, especially our young black males that are falling through the cracks, that that particular, it's, it's something missing. It's their conduit of utilizing what we know as waste is definitely missing. So one of my suggestions is the waste, the, what we consider waste air conditioning units, whatever it is, to get these units before they hit the rot, get them into the schools, even before they exit someone's home, get them into these schools, um, so that our young males, especially, I'm talking, I have a passion for our young males, can work on these things. I think, as the sister talked about red tape in the education system, that is a serious issue. What happens is we, we put our students, especially our males, in front of a classroom lecture setting for 30 minutes. They don't have their attention span. You put them in front of some technical, um, whether cycles, murders, or whatever, they strip them apart, they get excited. Once they're excited, then they wanna learn mathematics. You want to learn the size of a piston and what it's going to make to make, to make it fit into that block and that cylinder. That's what's missing in the schools today. So my immediate short-term solution is that the Department of Works and Engineering get together with the Ministry of Education and sort out our area of where um, these household, former household appliances, whether it's appliances or cycles or whatever it is, can be distributed into the household. Whether it's gas that's missing from these air conditioning units, whether it's thermostats, whether it's wiring, whether it's a chain. Just the other day I happened to go to Montana's Bay, a gentleman was throwing away a cycle, a push bike. I said, what's the matter, the wheel's been throwing it away. I took that bike, I said, I'll take it. I just happened to go get another wheel, a couple of sprockets put on it. I, I, I know my son and I, we go cycling because what? He's got a bike. He didn't have to go down town to spend 700 plus dollars on, on the same type of bike that this was. But what I am saying is that sometimes these solutions are right in front of us. And I could talk all night, but I'll give someone else a chance, an opportunity. You're a fantastic young man. And, and that's good because we realize we have to have short-term solutions right now. We have to act quickly. In another week, we may, and I don't, I'm not predicting, but we may have another incident. Let's put it that way. We're trying to find these solutions, but we, we must not stay in those halls of power simply discussing. We must hear 
solutions. We must hear solutions. So thank you, young man. Yes. Uh, good evening. So unfortunately, I have a tendency to look at the big picture. And as one of the younger people in this bra right now, I have some, I've heard some comments that make me think of some difficult questions. So I, uh, I've noticed that there's a repeating theme that we have a political system that doesn't inherently establish or inherently support the establishment of a technical institute. We have an educational system that doesn't support the establishment of the continuation of technical skills. And I ask, how do you intend to address the systematic issues that led to the Tech Institute closing and these same issues which I believe have kept a crucial aspect of our society from being sustained? So, is there any idea as to how we're going to do that? So, we, we thank you for the question. It will be a good time to have um, Reg Minus and Co. just come in a bit here. Uh, Reg, if you would. Good evening. Uh, I'm Reg Minus, um, class of 57, and it's definitely my pleasure to be here. Um, I would say that before I attended the TAG, I was one of the very average students. I couldn't get into the Barclay. My English was not that good, and I went to the TAG, and I'm just blessed to have been able to go there because I was motivated there to learn. I was motivated to learn. And, um, and, and I mean, I'm just so blessed that that happened. Went on and achieved many things in my life, and went off to, to England after that. Uh, and I can talk on my life and other things for a long period of time. You may all know that I'm uh, one of the owners of Tools and Equipment and Bermuda Bulk Gas is Limited. And we've been around for 46 years. We're all tech students. We all sat down way back in 17, said let's set something up and, and we're still together. I was chairing the meeting. I was chairing the meeting when the, when the lady got up and she said that the tech closed and uh, I know Rick might have been sitting next to me because I looked back and I saw that Rick's a, uh, a news media guy and I was surprised that that statement was made. But we closed the tech because it was too successful. And, and, and that, that type of answer sticks with us all still today. I mean, we haven't forgotten that. First, we never did get the full answer in regards to absolutely why. And, and I know that it's, it will be discussed and colleague Wasi and others have written and talked about it and thought about it and all the rest. And so you will hear some of those things. But, but I'm glad that as I look around this audience tonight, I see a number of tech businessmen. I mean, guys who have owned businesses, real sharp businesses, they're smarter than me. And, and it just really uh, makes me feel proud, and, and I'm just delighted to be here. But I'm gonna stop here and, and maybe pass it on to one of the others. Maybe Khalid Wasson will say Come something, because I know he wants to talk on this issue also. What well, one point uh, for us, uh, Khalid, I know you want to talk on concept okay. and, and all of that, but what we need to do, uh, first off, is to speak to that young man's question. We need to speak to that because unless we are successful in our lobbying, our meetings, and all of the above, we will be talking. So we want to move this from just talk, uh, and, and it was great, it is great to see and to hear on the news this evening the head of the construction industry, we welcome you and perhaps we can get a few comments uh, afterwards. But if you can speak to that, uh, colleague, yes. how do we proceed from here? Because our question also is where to from here. And some of our colleagues do have that, and, and they have an opinion on that. We ask them to be brief at this point. We've got some interesting people also coming forward. Khalid. Yeah, good evening, everyone. And believe it or not, Rick, I was going to answer the question we got. This, the, the last two speakers. And um, I would begin by saying one of the things we would want to do or would need to do is to incorporate some of the ingredients of what made tech in the first place. Um, and when I say that, I'm not just simply talking about the machines, the equipment, the digits, and everything else. 
but what was going on? I mean, we're, we are here, most of the people here can relate to what I'm talking about. Back in 1953, 54, people were putting a penny into their meters to get electricity. Many people, many houses. Shit. 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 I've seen pennies. I've seen pennies. I've seen pennies. I've seen pennies. Well, anyway, that, that, that's, there's a live audience. They got real men. So anyway, um, and, and you would probably also know there was probably about three or four hundred cars on the road total. That you could stand on the streets and almost have a cricket game because that was it. You could go all along Parsons Road, Kirkland Avenue, in the morning, and you could smell it. There were no toilets. There were inside toilets and most of the outdoor toilets. So the Industry understood that Bermuda was about to go into a technological swing with new things, new products, cars, um, air conditioning. All, all these things were coming on board. They were just starting. They were just beginning. And the question was, going, how are we going to service it? How are we going to deal with it? So the, so the part question that was answered by Rick, by Rick earlier, were they visionaries or social engineers? It was a bit of both. And I would add to you that if you're going to do something now, it would have to be contemporaneous, it would have to be current. You would have to think of where technology is today. You would have to get the industry, everybody who needs technology, in fact, everybody needs technology today, whether it's hotels, whether it's reinsurance companies, whether it's construction companies, whether it's motor mechanic companies, they all need technology. And what, what, what we need, and, and that technology needs to be sustained. So part of the solution is to bring the industry together to be a part of this, this process. We need, we need a steering committee of 11 or 12 or 13 or however many people we can get out of this initiative to drive it forward. But to wait to get it and get the momentum so we can actually develop these syllabus, which is, which is current in terms of technology, then you need the input of all these, um, all these companies and everybody else. So it's, it's almost like going back to EPT in a sense, the Educational Planning Team which did the rethink back in 1990. So I disagree with the point that was made about my uh, uh, lawyer McBee, and I had nothing against her, she's a cousin of mine, actually. But the issue was not an issue of vision back in 1968-70 when they made the decision to close Tech Tech. The issue of vision was in 1953-54 when Bermuda was entirely segregated and they needed to build an institution that was combined, that was satisfied, and, would, and the issue of duplication and multiplication of build this facility here and have it duplicated in five different places, it made no sense, it made no financial sense. So they had this one combined school. And it was an absolute failure in 1968-69 or 70, whenever they made the decision. They made the decision before it was closed. It was a political decision. And all the elements of it looks more political than it was visionary. Uh, the difference between tech and the, and, the, and the succeeding issue is, as mentioned, these were young boys who started in 11 and 12. And for the first three years of their education, they were taught all the technologies, whether it was motor related, metal related, welding, woodwork, any, every area of technology and its, and its, its supporting um, chemistry or technology, whether it was wood, wood technology, metal, metal, what type of metal, all of that was taught to these guys. By the time they were hit the third year, they made a choice to go one way or the other in, in concentrated training. Now when they graduated, they weren't, we weren't perfect mechanics or anything, but they were trainable on many levels. And I'm just take one level, one thing and leave it. Take Balco as an example. Balco you know you need linesmen. Balco also needs to have people that can go inside and work on the engines and, and all the turbines and all that kind of stuff. Then they also need individuals that can listen to the engines and be able to interpret the data to determine what's going on, what's happening in terms of the loads, too much load, not enough load, what are the cases. Then beyond that, they need individuals who could look at the data of all these things and say, systemically it's not working. We need to change the system. Now, what tech did, it provided 
the industry, and take Belka as one, with individuals who could fulfill every aspect. They can go in there and become linesmen, go into the motor mechanic area and become work on the engines. They could graduate towards dealing with the technology, go on and, you know, we, we produced one guy who died about three or four months ago. We got one minute. Uh, and he was not just the best in Barbuda, but one of the best in the world. So the technical education provided the base so you can go to all these things and go right to the top. So as um, Beverly said, no, it was not a bunch of individuals who, who, because they couldn't use their heads, we had to teach them how to use their hands. These were individuals who were taught and you could take and rise, they could rise to any level they chose. But anyway, sir, that the answer to it is to bring together the industry along with a, a, a plan of how we introduce it, whether you introduce it multiply throughout all the, all the school, all the schools, it had, so all of them had the disciplines, or whether you actually create one school. But I think may be highly competitive because they have a lot of pressure trying to get everybody into. But those solutions, I think, would be better worked out with uh, a combination of, of, uh, thank of you. industry and people. And thank you. Yes, good to see you. Thank you, Mr. Richardson, everybody at the head table, um, and all the assembled public interested. Um, I'm Charles Dunstan, for those of you who don't know, um, current president of the Construction Association. Um, I'm here more as an interested party, a tradesman, um, but I've heard some really good comments tonight. Um, Backtrack a little bit. I was in a meeting with um, a gentleman uh, recently, and he, he we were talking about trades training. We were talking about education, um, and he brought up the uh, topic of the Tech Institute and um, that there was an association as such of alumni. And I was fascinated to hear this. So where are they? Who are they? Let, let's. I need to meet these people. We need to connect. Um, the Construction Association, I think, has been on a bit of a meandering mission for quite a number of years. And um, in the last couple of years, during my tenure, we've come to realize that that has to stop. We need, we need a clear mission. We need a clear direction. And one of the biggest problems for me as a tradesman and an employer is lack of skilled labor. And I look around the industry, and I work with my peers, the guys who really know their stuff, the local guys who really know their stuff, um, all came out of town. It's a fact, you know, and unfortunately, unfortunately, they're a dying breed. They're, they're you know, on the, the back end of their careers. We need to capture that knowledge now, and we need to move with it. Um, so I guess I'm here to say that the Construction Association wants you, we want to hear from you, we want to talk to you, we want to be part of this committee, whatever it is that's going to happen. We have a plan for technical education in its infancy, but we have a plan. Um, some of the comments that these gentlemen made were, were spot on. Um, we need to take it to the youth, we need to take, we need to take it practical. Um, Ms. Sumner, we, you know, we, we want to be part of the Westgate um, curriculum, we have been a little dabbling and, and working with Ms. Grant and, and, and seeing some real success um, in very small batches, but we need to expand it. Um, we've been on a mission over the last year or more to go around the island and inventory, if you will, all the various <clears throat> disparate groups, programs, people, and it's been a fantastic journey. We've, we've met so many people that have so many great ideas and so much passion and so much energy, but everybody's doing something and they're going in all their different directions. No one's bringing it together, no one's controlling, no one's acting as a catalyst. And, and I think one of the key things we've learned, and this goes back to this, man's, this gentleman's comment um, about bringing the uh, Ministry of Education and Works and Engineering together. Well, if we were waiting for that, that ain't never going to happen. <laughs> We will never get anything done, and I think we learned that a while ago. We cannot wait for government. Yes. Government are not 
dare I say, qualified yeah. to pull that together. Yeah. They are there to act as a facilitator. We will go to them and we will get out of them what we need, but we have to do it. We have to do it. Okay? And I'm here to throw my hat into the ring and say, we have to do it. I want to be part of it. Hey, great stuff. So, I think that's music to the ears of the tech alum and also to the young men who are here tonight wanting to know what is going to happen beyond the top. I want to say also that I think we're on the right track. We, I see way in the background, Dr. Rudan Tankard, I saw early on, Dr. Lou Simmons, I've seen Bermuda College reps here, I've seen industry reps. What we must do now, each, each of you must go into your respective caps and let them know that it's time to move. There is an action plan. We, Tech Alums, stand by to be resource. And we certainly are not about to give this up. As I told a young man who, who greeted me the other night, we heard Mr. Dunstan, it's been discussed behind the scenes. It's time to bring it out front and center. It's time to let the single moms and others know there's hope for their kids coming along. I see our, our chairman, Dell, looking anxiously at the time. So here's what we did. The cathedral trade-off is they didn't provide us with air conditioning, they provide us with more time. So we want to get the comments and the questions made best use of this night. We're capturing it on video, not just to put little sound bites on television. We're capturing it so that we can reflect on it and give it to other industry partners. Yes, sir. Good evening, everyone. I actually attended Parentathon School with Mr. Charles Dunson. He was in one of my classes, a few of my classes. And I'm going to be brief. After having attended special reading at Harrington School and School, it was evident that my dream of becoming an astronaut was far, far, far away. Even though some of my teachers kept telling my mother that all I'm doing is taking up space in school. <laughs> Needless to say, it was evident to me that technical school was going to be the best for me. I didn't go to the original tech, but I went to Robert Crawford, which in my opinion was the next best thing. Okay. Hence, I was able to get among the, um, your sister spoke about having the academics. We had many people that went to Robert Crawford that were academically inclined. So they got both ends, you know? So I support, and I also would like to, if I may, nominate myself to be a part of that committee as someone coming out of technical school. You are welcome, sir. The next thing uh, that is um, solutions. Let's start with high school and make it mandatory, I don't know how we go about doing it, that no one leaves school without a GED. We can start there, because I mean, once you, once you have no GED, these, is people offering programs outside of high school, but if you don't get the GED, as soon as you walk in the door, your name is ready to file 13. So I think we need to start with making sure that people leave school with at least a high school leaving certificate. I'll leave it at that. Yes. All right, thanks much. Yes, sir. Recognizing. That's very gracious of you, sir. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Cecilia Lynn Ken, and I am married to a former tech person, and his name is Lionel. And my story would be different if he was here, but um, my story tonight is that I went to the Bermuda Technical Institute. And you might wonder why, because there was a lot of good looking, handsome guys. <laughs> but I had a young man just last week come to me 
And Mr. Boris, thank you for answering my question in that uh, he was 12 years old and it's unfortunate that all summer he was looking for a job and he wanted to learn uh, how to fix bicycles and how to fix motor cars. And he just happened to be talking to me last Sunday and I said to him, well, I'm going to look into um, seeing whether in your afternoons after school, maybe you can get um, some help with your dreams. And so, Mr. Morris, I was wondering what age young men were, and he was 12 years old. So thank you for answering my questions. And I think we have a lot of seniors, and I'm a senior myself, so I can speak to the seniors and all the talents and skills that so many of you have. And you shouldn't be put on the shelf. You could be helping some of these young men to move forward, as Mr. Boris stated in his comments. And I would like to see our seniors, both men and women, used a lot more than what I see them being used and not abused. That was one. Two, you're looking for solutions. There was a program at the uh, war camp called the Cadet Program. And I know that that program was having successes. And it was closed. I would like to see that revisited along with the Bermuda um, Technical Institute, the new Bermuda Technical Institute, which will incorporate both male and female. That is something I think needs to be looked at. And if some of you are younger than me, don't know what the cadet program was, go to the internet. I'm not that type of internet person, but I know it's on there, it's gotta be. Everything else it is. So go there and find out what it was all about. I am really supportive of a new technical institute. I work closely with the Boy Scouts over the years. And I also work with young men who I see some are very successful today and some who want to be successful today and need the help. I also see on the streets, and I'm going to finish with this, I see males who want to work but they just don't have the skills. And some of them are working and doing good but are getting a lot of negative stuff like not being paid on time. Okay, and they're being taken advantage of. It hurts me because I am a person who cares, and I know that we can make a difference if we speak out and start something in Bermuda that will make a difference. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, what we will do, we have speakers, uh, persons with questions and comments lined up. Let's go through that, and then we need to get on with the second part of our our speeches and of course some some of the guys are will, will have shorter comments yes you, you have an answer yes good evening firstly I'd like to bring people up to speed on what's really taking place in the country I worked in an industry that I was uh, now designed for I ended up becoming an elevator man which I spent 40 years I left the technical institute Graduated, mechanical engineering, welding, and all that type of good stuff. Electrical. I could wire a house before I left school. I met kids coming up through my years of, as being an elevator man, that couldn't read a word when they graduated from high school. Gary, can you tell us what you mean by being an elevator man? Well, <laughs> I'm a paper elevator man now. I, uh, I worked for Otis Elevator Company for, between Otis Elevator Company and Bermuda Elevator Company for uh, 40 years, over 40 years. I installed, repaired, service, whatever. And um, there I worked in all facets of, of um, in the elevator trade. I worked in a trade where, very unique. The only time that we had guys that came from outside that worked in the trade, were guys that came in because we had special projects, because we had so much work on. 
right? We had so much work in the elevator business. So we brought guys in, and the original was from England, and they came from the States, then they came from, we got the cheap labor thing, we got went to Mexico. So um, in all the years that I worked there, the, the skills that I attained through uh, bass, having a song bass, stuff that I could fix that uh, if I hadn't had the background, I never had a clue. So what my little small input on this is that what we need to do is start with our young people. No sense looking at me at 25. I'm already decided what I want to do in life, how many girls I want. So what we need to do is to bring our kids along and we need to have a separate a separate, I'm not talking, because that's what they did before. And it fell apart. They put the technical school into each one of the, uh, each one of the secondary schools, and it, within five years, it had fallen apart. Absolute nonsense. What they need to do is to have a technical school built and designed and with principles. And that was the other thing that you, you could ask Mr. Daniels or Mr. Rick Richardson. When you went to Technical Institute, you also developed principles. We've lost a lot of our principles. And that's the reason why we have mediocre behavior. Yeah. Anyway, I'm not going to go on and on because uh, it's kind of warm in here and uh, everybody else will want to turn. Have a nice evening. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, good evening, everybody. I am not a product of the Bermuda Technical Institute, but I am a product of technology. Um, and I'm here to lend my support in whatever way I can to resuscitate a technical institute. But we've got to ask ourselves a question. What am I doing? Or what have I done? Okay. And I'll answer that question for myself. I have been in Bermuda for about 10 years. Um, I've had various jobs, totally underemployed. But that's another story. We won't go into that just yet. I started off a Bermuda Robotics Club <coughs> up the hill. Most people you know um, spent a lot of money and we just had mentioned how the equipment that was there, the technical part, had gone to waste. <coughs> I started this club. We went from Barclay to Cedar Bridge. I approached the Pembroke Parish Council to see if we could utilize their space. A lot of people made nice sounds. I went to Bermuda College to say, hey, you've got, a lot of, you've got a lot of space there. We would like to set up a tech shop. Okay. It's a little different from the, 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 the technical institute. And the tech shop is designed so that People who are retiring from the trade can lend their hand and each one teach one and they'll learn a variety of trade. Okay? We can't limit it to just uh, air conditioning or water mechanics or whatever. Um, so with that said, let me give you my background. Okay? I started off life at Keele University in England. I developed a cochlear neuron. Okay? Taught a lot of students, I won't say that kid, a lot of students about electronics. So my passion is electronics, which is part of technology every day. You know, you, make, you take whatever you like, and there's an electronic board somewhere, and I've been trying to set up an electronic repair shop. And by the way, I am a frequent visitor to Tynes Bay, otherwise known as the Sears Robot or Bermuda. Okay, and I, it has, I've taken a lot of parts there. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity for recycling yes. and earning money that I've approached the previous government with proposals. I know other people have approached the previous government with proposals.
proposals. And I'm sure some people will approach the current government with proposals, but nothing seems to happen. I am more than prepared to dig into my pocket. It's not a very deep pocket, but I do run the Saturday Bermuda Robotics Club. I have to reach into my pocket every now and then to buy the bits and pieces to teach the trade of soldering, uh, learning about components, assembling them. Um, and I was horrified, okay? I approached Bermuda College to say, okay, we would like to set up a tech shop here, and by the way, there'll be some commission for you. Rental income and whatever, and the tech shop will be self-supporting. And all we ask for is the space and the utilization of the equipment. We will take on the risk. So other than offering us all that money, uh, I want you to wrap up on your solutions because Dell, find out more about this guy. And uh, let's not do it too fast. I might think we want all the money. But, uh, go on. The solution these days, I mean, you hear it all over the place, okay? Everybody's running a STEM camp. Yeah. Well, there's STEM camps and there's STEM camps. And one of the previous speakers mentioned there's no coordination. Yes. Okay. Uh, now I don't know where that coordination comes from. Okay. I'm more than willing to lend my part in that. Giving it to an 11 board committee uh, may be a solution. Yeah. Okay. I don't know this, Diasta, but each of us needs to come in and ask ourselves questions. What am I? Doing. Sure. Thank we thank you very much. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, the Honourable Adi mentioned 11 men committee. We tech alums, a number of guys <laughs> will form part of the think tank and you can plug in to our group and we will see the things moving forward. But we will not work in and cannot work in isolation. This, we need to move the community. We, we need to find out more about some of the schemes and things that are working. You know, we're, we're not here just to reinvent the wheel. There are some things really working. We need to coordinate them. We need now to move forward. When we started this, we basically asked ourselves a question. What is it that we're looking for? What do we want? We were not sure if that is another physical, technical institute building, but certainly if that's the will of the people, we will lobby and move and suggest on that. Thank you very much for that. Yes, Jerry. Evening, uh, Joseph Robson, class of 64. Um, two things first. They will say, when somebody tells you who they are, just believe them, don't, don't question them. So when I was at that meeting and it was told to us that tech was stopped because it was too successful, don't ponder that. That's what the situation was. A certain class of people were becoming too mobile and the plan was to stop them and that was it. Simple, that's it, that's that part. Um, another part is that my class, I know more than half of the students in my class had taken the Barclay exam and passed, but decided to go to tech. So when we get to the little thing about academics and all that, let's, let's be very clear about that part. But this is what I want to say. I'm connected with Sam's uh, secondary and middle school, and as of right now, um, Sam's, this is the gentleman who's talking about STEM, everybody wants to talk about STEM. We cannot wait for government, and Sam's is not waiting for government. SANS is a STEM program that's already in place. Uh, last year, year before last, we started building um, Opti sailboats. So there's no school that's doing that. We started that. We have, uh, so that's a, that's a boat building program that we have in place presently. We are the only holders of, of a certificate for aquaculture certified by government. So we are presently raising tilapia for sale uh, we have an agricultural program. Right? Before this year, is out, we'll have an aquaponics program. Marvelous. So these are things that are in our STEM program. Now, in addition to all of this, with our business program, uh, the statistics that are, the data that's going to come from these two businesses as such, is going into our business program, and that's going to fuel the entrepreneurship side 
of, of education. So when we have business studies and you're just learning about something that means nothing to you, we're going to have relevant data. So by the time our young people come out of middle school, in terms of advertising, in terms of how to set up a business, in terms of how to market it, all of that will be done by the time they're 14 years old and leave San Secretary Middle School. That's going to be in place. It's already, we're working on that right now as we speak. So I would say that um, all is not dark, but yes, we cannot wait for government. Government is not going to lead us down the road. It's already proven to us that it's not the road that they want us to take. And if we're going to wait for that and we think that's going to come, then poor us. I think most of us here are really dissatisfied that we have not done anything in the past 60 years towards this thing that we're working at now. I would suggest and invite anybody who's interested that wants to come uh, and talk about the, the program at SAMS. Um, we can certainly have a, a think tank call. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jerry. Yes, sir. Yes, good night, everybody. I'm not ready to do that. I need to sound a part of you. I came to bring some solutions. I'll give you a little story about myself. A lot of people have been asking me to come up to talk to you guys as far as myself. Um, I'm a product of Bermuda Education. I got my associate's degree, five other certifications, styles, more the world is name, and I got it. Um, I also have a company right now that we have built because we got tired of waiting for government to try to set up a tax school. So we've created our own tax school. My company is called the Sandy Technologies. Some of you may know about us, some of you may not. I've been on the uh, TV, radio, talk show. I was also always done a, um, a forum on us and where was that about our company. It's actually in the back of time, believe it or not. We've taken 13 young men with no skills and trained them up from nothing to something. Um, we currently have a staff of eight. We have five vehicles. We service everybody for IT. We are also a contractor for Logic. We used to be one for cable vision. We do everybody from the Magus Cop to Belco to Telephone Company. We do everything, you name it, we do it. But we train our guys up from the beginning. I came here to offer my services and my skills and my knowledge to help you guys to create a tax code. Um, this is something that I've been looking for for a long time. I fought with the NTP back when Michael Still was there. And their biggest thing was what happens if we have too many technicians? And I told them a long time ago that. If we have too many technicians, we don't outsource nothing. We can start outsourcing some of our technicians. There are also a lot of solutions up there. But um, I just want to put myself forward and actually help you guys to drive forward because I do technology. I do Wi Fi, internet, extenders, e boxes. A lot of people know about that. And we're, we're actually number one in the market right now for that. Young man, thank you. <laughs> just, just before our, our next gentlemen comes aboard. We are so pleased to see our young men coming forward. There are some fellas here who are running programs and a part of their frustration is not seeing young men come forward like we're seeing tonight. So we want these young men to take the baton and carry it forward. We want to support, we will form that support group and we love the fact that they've come forward. Wise head coming forward now. Yes sir. Good evening. My name is George Burt. Many of you may see me on CI TV doing a building show. I came here this evening because I'm concerned about the building industry. I will tell you the truth, I'm not here to slam anyone, but it's three buildings have been going on in my neighborhood, and what I see going on there, we are definitely in need of technical training. I see chaps slating the roof. When I was out learning my trade a few years ago, I'm not going to tell you how many years ago, we were taught how to take a slate and to rub it in. All I see these chaps doing now is pressing a slate down in the mortar. I offered one of the contractors, I offered to teach his chaps how to make the proper cuts for the roof. And let me tell you what the response I got. 
if you teach them how to do that, it's going to take too long and I wouldn't be able to make any money. <laughs> Lo and behold, before he moved off that job, he was up there taping the ridge off the roof a half a dozen times. And the back one, the roof now. <laughs> Point made, sir. I, I have to ask you to cut it right there because we've got two behind you. We want to ask you guys to, to be quick. Our next speaker has, uh, has to leave soon, so we want to get uh, him up. Uh, yes, recognize him. Glad uh, you don't have too much time. Uh, anyway, middle ten graduates here do air conditioning filtration, air conditioning repair. Not one. Okay. What I propose is this: what we would really need. Part of the solution is we need a tech revolution. If everybody that's sitting here tonight and we had air conditioning, I could probably appeal to all of you and get at least ten dollars from you. The way that we need to go about this is crowdfunding. The young man that came up and said, how do you find solutions? He's talking about the modern day, modern technology, modern way of doing things. I can bet $1,000 that I may have in the bank right now that now one, maybe two or three people in this room has gone out and talked to one of the families of the mother or the father or the child or the family that has gotten shot within the last two or three years. We don't do that. We don't need technology to do that. We need to start a revolution, a tactical revolution to start in a small room. We need an office that can pay $200 a month. We've got the technology. We need the human resources. We need to start building them in a pocket because what happens in Bermuda with great talkers and great listeners for one event and after that it's all over. You've got to commit to yourselves. Everybody get $10 tonight. Get a room, start, and let the tech be a private enterprise, just like Work Academy and all those others. Start in a small space, and let's go from there. Revolutionize. We've got to get out. Get out your gun. Your gun is your thinking. Tech did many things, but one of the best things that it did for me personally, among all the trades, it gave us the opportunity during a lunch time to learn the game of chess. Chess teaches you all about life. We need to start teaching these children from young, go into those homes, find out who the parents are, who has the challenges, take those kids, put them on our roof, and start a tech revolution. Hey, thank you. So following this young man, we will have our next speaker. We'll move it along a little quickly. But listen, we tonight have to have the staying power tonight. We want you to stay here, debate, give solutions, but we must stick to it because if we are to be successful in moving beyond this point, if you can't get beyond tonight, you won't know how to drive this vehicle after this. So, appreciate you, stick with it. Yes, young man. Hi, evening everybody. My name is Nairori Nangs. I'm the grandson of Elvin Nangs. Can you stand up for me, please, Mark? <laughs> Alright, I just wanted to um, say that I'm an example of, you know, somebody that's been through everything you guys have been talking about. And at the age of 13, I had got into fixing bikes. And it was the best thing that I had to do. And from that stage on, I learned um, about automobiles, marine mechanics, being a salesperson, not just being a mechanic, but being like a manager and a business owner and working in different fields. Um, and so, like, I try to encourage young people, you know, my age and older, you know, that I know that, you know, if it wasn't for mechanics, I mean, I could have been in these streets, I could have been a gang member, I could have done this, but, you know, I keep my peace with everybody. Everywhere I go, you might see me speaking to five, ten people every two minutes. You know? I have people that I know from east to west. I'm cool, I can go wherever I want. I have no problems with nobody. Here, here. Mm. I keep to myself. You know? and, uh, <laughs> uh, I do have a problem with education. I'm working on getting my GED. I had um, problems in the education well, I had teachers, some people told me that I was going to be in jail and my father and I got help. You know, I learned to manage my anger and everything. And my mechanical skills um, helped me to become the person.
wash my hands again. And so therefore, I would just like to say that, you know, I feel that if somebody were to take a student from, you know, each school or anything, and just take them under the wing and just teach them automobile mechanics or teach them marine mechanics or anything like that. And I had to fight to where I get to, um, to get to where I am today. I had a lot of people tell me, you can't do this, you can't do that. Whenever I wanted to learn something, before I even went into the um, field, I just went online and looked up and researched what I wanted to get in because I had a passion for doing it. And I recently um, just connected with Art and Construction and I had a meeting with them about two weeks ago. And I just told them that I was passionate about getting my heavy truck lesson that I was excited that I passed my test, my written exam. So we had told and they were gonna, said they were going to um, help me to get my heavy truck and try the trailer license. But I also had stressed on that I wanted my education. And that's one thing that's helped me back from a scholarship for 40 grand from the NTB to go and um, to go to name the town. It was very frustrating for me and also the company that I worked with, the Marine Company, I um, was capable of going away to get trained privately to uh, fix BRP, CDU, and every um, machinery. And now they just came up with a new machine um, that contributes to aviation, which is the field that I want to get into. And I've been fighting to get my education for years, you know. And I've been to schools that told me that they don't teach academics, they couldn't teach the hands-on, and it kind of frustrated me and discouraged me. But I mean, my fight from 16, from getting my GED, I'm 20 now, and I'm still fighting to get my GED. And I know what I need, what I um, need to, the areas that I need help in. And I tell people this, but it's like, they're not, I'm not telling the right people, so I'm not getting the help that I need. So the people at Island Construction, I told them that, you know, I'm looking to work because I need to work because I pretty much support myself. I mean, I was helping my family, you know, pay bills, rent, bulk, go care, all those types of things, and, you know. And then on top of babysitting my little brother, um, working, and trying to get an education, and it was too much for me. And I'm now in a space where I'm like, I need to slow down on working and focus on my education so that I could get the years ahead that I'm looking for so I could be successful in life, you know. The first thing that I want in life right now is a host. You know, I'm 20 years old, I want a host, I want a car, I want to support my family, and I want to not put my family through things that I went through growing up, you know, and be there and get the support that I didn't get, you know, growing up. So, with that being said, they are actually going to sponsor me to get my GD in September. And I got my heavy truck and heavy truck and being that you know, I'm really looking to do that, I mean, I'm very eager to start school, you know, this September and get that out of the way. That's my main focus before behind, like, having fun or anything like that. But, Appreciate your comments. But um, just, to, just to say um, that it would be a good idea to, you know, just take, you know, some students and just yeah. take certain ones and take one of the wins. Marvelous. I think we, we are grateful that you've come forward because we ask these questions. How are we going to combat the anti-social behavior? <laughs> you could have gone the other way. Someone reached out, allowed you to grow, progress. We'll be looking for you for a number of these programs. Thank you very much. So, I want to bring forward a, a young man who is flourishing uh, in the industry. He's been very patient uh, with us. He did have to leave a bit earlier, but he's still with us. So I want to talk uh, and bring forward Roger Todd, who is at Belco. I won't do his whole bio, but I've got to get into it this way. Roger is Vice President of the Power Generation Group at Belco. He holds a Master of Power Engineering degree from Loughborough University and is a Chartered Engineer with the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. He has, uh, so the UK, he's got 27 years experience in the en energy industry. He has managed plant operations, 
energy planning, system reliability, and engineering. I'll say he is a graduate of Work Academy, and Roger right now is a VP at Belco. There's much more to tell you about that, but we'll let him come forward, wind up in this bit that I've left out, and ask him to deliver some remarks before he has to leave. Roger. Hello. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for, for your patience and sticking with the dialogue. I think it's, it's a very important dialogue. Um, my father, Richard Todd, he attended Tech uh, many years ago. Nice <laughs> the alumni here. And uh, he reached out to me and he said, Roger, you know, um, you were born in 1972. So <laughs> clearly you didn't know about Tech. But he, and over the years, my dad has explained uh, the, the history of tech, and I've enjoyed learning a lot of history here tonight. Um, but we're going to fast forward uh, quite a few years, about 43 years to, to today. Um, we'll make a stop along the way at 1989, which is when I left Work Academy. And when I left Work Academy, uh, I was at risk. I was at risk of not going on to higher education because it was not something that there wasn't a college fund sitting there waiting. Um, my parents were divorced, both working class, trying to pay bills. This is a story that many of you may be familiar with and many are still familiar with today. Um, but the difference was uh, there was a guidance counselor in the school who announced that there was going to be a presentation by Belco and that we should all go to a certain classroom if we were interested and in fact the counselor identified a few students who they thought might be a good fit for the vocational uh, education so we all went along it was it was a big class and this was a tour that Belco was doing around the island went to all of the schools in fact and uh, a total of about 100 students across the island attended this presentation on the relaunch of Belco's apprenticeship program. And so I just want to take a moment to give credit to uh, Elf Orton and to Eugene Cox, who were leading the organization at the time and saw very much the need to reinstate uh, formal, structured, accredited, apprenticeship program within the organization, not only to meet the organization's needs, but to meet the broader island needs as well. And so in 1989, uh, I sat in this presentation at 16, and I was, I was captivated by what was prevent, presented. Um, I, at the point where I was leaving high school, I was going to go to Bermuda College, probably, do the Diploma in Arts and Science. I wasn't particularly enjoying the classroom at that time, so I don't really know how well I would have done. But uh, attending this presentation, it set a light bulb off in, in my mind. They explained the apprenticeship program. The first year, we would travel to, to England, to York in the UK. And we joined a cohort of British Rail lads, that's it they say in England, um, and they were doing their foundation in basic engineering skills, and this was the City and Guilds 201 at that time, or the part one of City and Guilds. And we spent a year over there, not only going to Tech College, but also getting a broader experience of being 16, being away from your parents. There were five of us um, in a foreign country, and I, I don't know, if you know, but uh, the further north you go in England, the wider it gets. Um, and so coming from a, a country where I'm amongst majority blacks and being plucked in the north of England at 16 and having to adapt to the culture and everything else, that in itself was an education. Um, but what was in the program, we came back from England with our City and Guilds Part 1, and then at that time, Belco had set up 
what the training center was an accredited center of excellence. And I believe this is a, is a starting point um, for moving the technical education forward in a coordinated way. It may not be a single large technical institute that everyone goes to. It may be a series of centers of excellence with accredited bodies from countries that have established programs, whether it's the NVQ, the BTEC, the City and Guilds, or many of the North American programs, Alberta, etc. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, there were seven of us that came into the program in 1989, and we all completed our apprenticeship. We went on when we came back to the company, depending if you showed a, a, a preference for mechanical or electrical, you were distributed into the different departments of the company. I served out the next, uh, the remainder of my four-year apprenticeship in the powerhouse, working on the diesel engines and the gas turbines, working underneath a specialist and going one day a week to the training center to do my advance, my academic component of my vocational learning. It was still an applied science. So even though it was theory, it was the theory of pumps and systems and all the componentry that I was working on during the other four days of the week. I had to keep a very disciplined log book. I learned how to organize my work and, and I only threw it away a couple of years ago because you know, I, I held it with such pride. Unfortunately, that program has come away a bit at Belco and in the role that I have now, we're, I'm working very hard with some of the, the other VPs and our HR and we're bringing on board a new learning and development specialist because as a product of this development, we understand the importance of it. We understand the value of it that it brings to the organization. Now, someone said that, you know, if you continue this program, you're going to have too many technicians. Well, we had seven, seven that came into the organization uh, in 1989. All seven of those are still employed in Belfort. 27 years ago. Five of those are at senior management or executive level within that. So it's not that technical learning and technical education is for those who don't have academics. It's a vocational path. It's an alternative path to the A-levels, to the classroom, to the strictly theory. After my university degree, I, I'm sorry, after my apprenticeship, I completed my BTEC National Certificate, which is the equivalent of A-levels, which is the equivalent entry level into university. By then, I had worked on the equipment enough that I was inspired to learn more. I was now hungry to be in the classroom. I went from five, four or five years prior to being a student out of high school who really didn't have an appetite for being in classrooms anymore, to now desperately wanting to get back into full-time academics. And when I did that, I went through my degree. It's the things that you have that you don't appreciate, but my colleagues who I was working with, we would be working on a turbo machinery module or something like this. And I was very familiar with the turbocharger or the gas turbine because I had stripped it down and built it back for four years. And they would say to me, you know, I kind of wish I had done it that way because right now this just looks like a diagram on the paper for me. I, I can't begin to conceptualize what this piece of equipment is. And so there's huge benefit to, to the technical education program. That's a glimpse at, at what transpired for me between 19... 89 and 1994. I then went on and, and achieved my master's in power engineering, came back to the company, and since then I've, I've probably had about seven different jobs at progressing through the ranks. Very, very grateful to the organization and to the commitment that Belco has shown and continues to show, uh, and also to many of the other organizations out there. 
I believe it's been said, you know, we spent a lot of time uh, discussing and, and referencing back to the tech college days, but we have not lost technical education in Bermuda. We have lost a sense of coordination. We have lost um, perhaps alignment and accreditation. Uh, I know, for example, uh, many of you may have read it as well, Work Academy last year, recognizing that when the kids were getting to 16, they were faced with uh, going on to do international baccalaureate. And if any of you have children that have done that, it is a very, very demanding program. If a child comes through the IB program successfully, they're set. The, the colleges will be lining up for them. But if you're not so inclined, it, it is like putting a square peg in a round hole. And it can be so demoralizing because you can have such a capable individual feel like they're not cutting it because we don't have the option for something else. And so recognizing this and, and perhaps motivated by the loss of sales as well, I mean, Work Academy was realizing that a number of their students were electing not to continue past 16 into the IB program because it wasn't the right fit. But credit to them, they launched the BTEC curriculum last year. And BTEC is Business and Technology Education Council out of the UK. And it's a broad range of vocational learning. It's hospitality, they had four hospitality graduates um, this year from the program. It is um, engineering, it's business, it's tourism, it's sports management, uh, events management. It's, it's a series of, it's a sweep of vocational learning. And so I think when we look at the opportunity that this represents for Bermuda, you get to train and develop local talent. That means you become less dependent on foreign talent that ultimately will leave. And I, I see this within the organization all the time. Um, we can bring in, and they could be a great fit for the organization, have the right skill set. But ultimately, at some point, the, the majority of the non-Bermudian workers will leave the island. And they'll take with them all of that knowledge and familiarity that they've accumulated with your systems, with your plant, with your people. And then you start all over again. And the recruiting process alone is lengthy and it's costly. So you develop the local talent. And that talent, in all likelihood, will stay. If it doesn't stay in your organization, it's going to stay in your island. And that's going to benefit the bigger picture. You create gainful employment and you start to create some social stability. People feel like they have an option. Not everyone can afford to pick up and go off to England for a year. Even if it's sponsored, some people have responsibilities. Just because someone's 21 and maybe has a family already, does that mean they should give up on the idea of, a, of an education? So having that available locally creates huge opportunities. You're going to reduce the overseas spend. I can tell you as a VP of power generation, when I have to bring a turbocharger specialist in to service one of our turbochargers, I'm probably paying $10,000 just in expenses. We all know how much hotels cost. Turbochargers don't care if it's peak season or not. They're going to fail when they fail. <laughs> so you could be paying four or $500 a night for a hotel. And you're going to pay them from the time they leave their house travel time. And I wouldn't even get into the rates. It's not the rates they get paid, it's the rate the company gets paid. So there, there is a serious uh, cost benefit in this as well, but it's not a short-term gain. It requires long-term investment. You reduce that overseas spend. You reduce the spend, period. But if you're reducing the overseas spend, instead of paying ABB of Switzerland or ABB of New Jersey, you're paying Ascendant Technologies or any number of other local entities or even your, those in your local employee. This in turn reduces the cost of doing business. So your labor bill goes down. 
So what? The cost of doing business in Bermuda then goes down. So now you start to increase the competitiveness and the attractiveness of Bermuda as a place to do business. So when you go to the salon, the hairdressers, the spa, you see a lot of non-Bermudians working there. And you say, well, these are skilled jobs, but are they highly skilled jobs that local Bermudians can attain or aspire to? No. But the facility isn't there to train and develop to accredited standards. And so when that ad hits the paper, it asks for what? NBQ level three, city and guilds certification. And you look around and you say, well, I don't have that. No point me applying. And then they go through the process of bringing someone in. And so the cycle continues. And so we, we need to get these centers of excellence, and by that, I mean it could be a business. It could be the tools and equipments of the world. It could be the, the birth salons, or the, you know, I'm just calling names out, but it, it could be Tommy's Welding Company, who aligns with, I see Mr. Can in the audience, uh, from the National Training Board who maybe facilitates and, and helps the businesses, provides them with a structure for what an apprenticeship should contain and what an apprenticeship should look like. And then maybe there's that one day a week when they go to the Bermuda College or to the Technical College or wherever that, or the Belco Training Center, wherever that tutor is, who's going to help them to get through that academic component. So you're getting that four days, working under a skilled specialist, practical, hands-on, and then you get in that one day a week where you're getting the exposure. But the structure and the coordination isn't there. I know there are a lot of good programs going on. I, I, I've heard about them, but they are very disparate. They are very um, here and there, and they're not talking to each other. I know Bermuda Motors and, and other automotive uh, outfits are, are, are developing their technicians. So with that said, I, I want us to be encouraged. Um, we remain committed to technical education. And I think your presence here tonight in this very warm room <laughs> is evidence of that. Um, I personally have been a product of, of training and development and Belco and, and not even just Belco, but individuals at Belco's investment in me. So I carry that with me every day. I carry that responsibility to, to pass it on and to give someone else an opportunity and to contribute where I can. Fantastic. Now. We're on the home stretch, so if you wish, so that you are able to get up after this, the long session, stand, stretch, as I call uh, a young man forward, Anthony Webb, and Anthony is in the trenches, and we want him to relate that story. Where can I call me this morning? actually been a conversation for years about um, the state of our island. And for a minute I sat there and I was like, am I in the right room? I, I, I've been listening um, to everyone talk about TAP. I believe first we have to identify that the, the Bermuda that we're now living in. My story is a little different. I'm not going to talk too much about myself because I'm not really here to speak about myself, but to really speak on behalf of all the young men like myself that was caught up in prison, that have been rejected by the island, by the world of successful men. I came out of school in 1983, 4.0 grade point average, and smuggled drugs on my life. Never went to college, 
Never had no trade, anything, smuggle drugs. I cleaned up when I was 29 years old, when I came out of prison. I have been drug free, alcohol free for 20 years come September next year. I also, I work at Salvation Army, I'm drug free, I've been working there for 15 years, or 16 years, 16 I believe. And I also I have my own business, I have a clothing store, I um, had that for 15 years, I've been won multiple Bassett and Wheeler Awards. And a couple years ago, I was coaching out at BA, and I deal with a lot of guys that are involved in the streets, in the shootings, in the killings, on a regular basis. I have godsons and nephews, and, and I deal with them on a regular basis. And um, about two years ago, Miss Kim Jackson had offered me a job in government. Now, now I work for no one. I come out of a lifestyle of always making money for myself. When I was like 12 or 13 years old, me and a friend of mine, we used to go to Naval Field. We used to get all the alcohol bottles, all the vodka bottles. We used to take them to my granny's house. We used to boil them, sterilize them. We used to go get Father John, cherry leaves, and lemongrass. And we used to make herb tea. And we used to go take it to the guys up the street and we used to sell herb tea. That was at 12, 13 years old. So I have been to Kim. I took up her offer. So I went to work at Maris for two years. No degrees, no nothing. One thing only computer. And I, I really believed that I was successful in Maris. And I stayed there for two years, and then I really felt that this was not for me. I believed that it was killing who I am. I'm not a person to sit in the office. And um, after being, you know, working for myself, having a successful business for so long, as much as I wanted to work and support the young people, it wasn't benefiting. It was benefiting me, but at the end of the day, I wasn't. I had to move. So I gave up a nice wage at a manager's position. And just before I left, Kim had approached me, I think two years now, in Jan or January, with, with an initiative. And the initiative was to go out into all the communities and get the stakeholders of each community and have meetings with them in regards to the young man on the streets. So I read the initiative and I said to her that I don't feel comfortable with that. I really, this is probably the first forum I've spoken in. I really don't do this. I'd rather stay in the background and as, as I go on you will understand. I'm, I'm not a, a, a talker and I find that we come together and we talk about and we don't have no relationship with, and we don't, do, don't get our hands dirty. So I said to her, I said, instead of us having a meeting with all the stakeholders in the community, and all the champions of the community, which are the pastors and the coaches and everybody, and the MPs of the community, why don't we have a meeting with the guys? I said, Kim, I'm not gonna ride across the guys and go sit up in the club or wherever we're having in some church, I mean, I'm a Christian, and have a meeting about the guys and don't invite them. I'm not going to be a part of that. So she agreed. So what happened, it was called Change by Us. So we started a program two years ago. So I got all the guys up Somerset together, got the guys in the city together, and the guys in Southampton together. We had meetings with over 30 guys and our intention was to find out what are the needs and what are the concerns. And as small as community is, every neighborhood, it was three things that was common, but it was different. And the majority was education, businesses, and jobs. So we partnered with small business, we partnered with community college, 
be part of the workforce development and Bermuda Economy. So they have came and we have multiple meetings with 50 guys. We actually started a GED program of SAMS, of SAMS at um, past uh, Janice's church with the help of Ms. Daniels and Mr. Lister. And what happened while I was in government, we had multiple meetings in each parish and it was all the same. So, you know the meetings didn't continue, right? The meetings went on for a minute and then it didn't continue. I also, when I left Morris Kim, she didn't want to lose me, so she put me, uh, gave me a position with Team Street Safe, which has no funding, which I work closely with. And what happened was, when we stopped having a meeting, I was still seeing all the guys on a regular basis. I was close to in the city, I stay up the country, so I still see all these guys. Everybody else was in the meeting, they don't see these guys, they don't interact with them. So they're asking me, what's going on? They're like, you know, it's nothing about how their government's this and government's that. So what I done with my little bit of resources and my, you know, just wanted to be an advocate for the guys that are still on the street, I can leave Somerset, I can leave Hamilton, I can leave Southampton. I went out, I went Somerset, I got a couple houses to paint, and I got the guys up Somerset to help me paint them. I actually went to this guy's house, my architect's house, and when I was leaving to give him a price for his roof, when I was leaving, I saw this guy outside. Come to find out, he was the facilities manager down at St. David's. So I told him about the initiative, since which he has been giving me schools to do, power washing, and whatever area that I get to work in, I hire guys from that area. Mm -hmm. So, for me, the housing has been giving me a little bit of work. So I've been out there doing, doing this initiative on my own, just trying to get work for the guys in the community. I really, I've been talking to Rick for a while about really like, doing a, a, a program and really letting the island know. I believe 80, maybe 90% of this island does not know what these guys face on a daily basis. I was working, I had my godson working with me. He's actually incarcerated now for something he didn't do. And we was painting his house, and I said to him, oh, we got a house done by pontoons in about a week or so. First thing he came out of his mouth, he said, I'm not going down to get my hair blown off. And I got angry because it's not my reality. So I have forgot for a minute, but it's a constant reality. These guys cannot move around. You know how many times I have to deliver clothing from my store, take it home or take it up to the country because car guys cannot come to Hamilton. And guys have been, when I first started working for Team Street Safe, I went to Somerset, and with all these young boys just hanging out down by Naperville, I'm talking about 14 or 15 years old. And I was like, I, I was like, why are these guys are not in school? <coughs> they were done in home school because they can't go party. And I'm telling people, and people's like, they must have done something. They ain't done nothing. It's because of where they're from. I know some kids ain't done a thing. And they, they're being deprived of public education. I have both of my kids in work academy, especially my boy because I don't want him to get caught up in that social stuff that's going on. And when I was working at Mirrors, we was doing um, mediation groups with the guys from Hamilton and the guys from Somerset, and all the parents knew each other. And I believe that I done a workshop not too long ago, it was on uh, supporting uh, young people in being successful. And you know what the key thing was? Rejection. Eject and eject. And I've been telling people that for years. The guys that are on the street, they've been rejected by this community. By us. You know, I sit there and I listen like I, I, I'm one of them. Out of prison. My closest mate's got a trade. He's been in prison. He can't even get a job. 
So even with TH3 say, we have a list of guys that want to work. So we send them workforce development, you know, they get the stats. They go apply for a job, they take, you know, all the necessary assessment classes, they apply for a job. As soon as their name comes up, they don't get the job. So what if we want to take the guns out of our hands, or what we don't give them nothing? Imagine waking up every morning hopeless. Fathers, mothers. Working in the drug field for the last 16 years. Most of these guys that are caught up in this gang violence, most of their parents, at least one of them, has been drug abusers, abusing drugs. So I was sitting there and I was listening and I was like, do I, you know, I really didn't know, I just came because, like I said, Rick had invited me. And I really would like to, I don't like to really just speak at people, I really like to have a conversation with any questions. And I'm just, I just on TNT Tatum yesterday, and one of the young men had been shot like six or seven times. And when I was working at Mirrors, he volunteered at Mirrors for a whole year. And to the firm. Still can't get a job. He worked at Mirrors faithfully. He used to come here once a week, one, once a week, and to the firm. Told him what to answer the firm, talk to volunteers. Still can't get a job. I know this young man, right? I, and, I, and, I, and I thought about this earlier. I didn't know what I was going to say, but I knew I wanted to share this. It's a young man. We send young boys away when they're 13 and 14, because we really like this. We send them to this place called, it's a wilderness program, to be successful. I know one young man, his brother's dead now from being murdered. They sent him away because he was at risk. His came back, only word to being successful, whole different mindset, whole different conversation. What's in place for him? Anybody guess? That's one young man. Only word to being successful. Been on, in the wilderness program for three years. Talks different. Walks different. Where do you think he is? Right now. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One boy we send away and comes back and we have nothing to continue for him to be successful. <coughs> That's what we're up against. And even when I heard about the tax school, I'm like, well, where are we going to put it? That's not for my guys. Yeah, where are we going to put a tax school? Who's going to go to that? Guys, oh, way outside of their schools. If you're dealing with a certain demographic, young black man between the ages of 13 and 30 something. I'm so proud of that young man. I know, wow. And for him to stand up at that age and say he gonna go anywhere, that's amazing. You know how many young men his age with them and we stop the violence, they're not going to change. 
we have to sit down and have a conversation with the guys from the city and the guys from Somerset. We had a conversation years ago at Crossback. I was actually a part of that. I facilitate that. It was of course maybe 16, 17 years ago. When I'm talking to them. So in the meantime, they still want to work. So why we can't find employment in each of their neighborhood where they can work? I think that will go a long way to stem the violence. I'm actually a member of Canada. I'm not political. I don't vote. Never voted. Don't care who's in power. Because <coughs> that's how I grew up. It does not matter to me. I'm successful because of boy, not because of no politicians or nothing like that. That's how I live. I don't get treated like that. Because it's like, who helps, who helps them? Guys get shot. I was out there when the young man got shot out by BA. Who's the only hospital? Who comes around but your family? Gina, what's Gina knows what I'm talking about? There's a lot of work with Gina. There's nobody around. These guys on the street, there's nobody helping them. They've really been rejected by us. We have to take responsibility. Don't point your finger at government. We have, we have the resources. I'm doing it. And I'm not trying to you know, toot my own or anything like that because I'm, I'm not even scratching the surface. But there's a lot of young men out there. The young man that died on the bike the other day, he wanted to be a nurse. He was coming to our meetings. Yeah, the, two, the, the young man down at that, um, the home invasion, he was part of our program. He was down at uh, Egg and Fish. They let him go. He was working out. He was doing really well. He's like, how come they're keeping these guys that are full time, that are sitting around doing nothing, and they're not keeping me? And they let him go. So we got him a job washing pots. He didn't like it. And then he's, he's not working. So then when I heard that it's an invasion, I'm like, okay, well, we had him. We'll go down the line. And the kids that we have, and we're here. And we're not doing nothing for them. Everybody, it's not in my house. It's not a fact of me. So we go about our business until it's our faxes. And we're not doing, I feel that, that's, I really can't, like, I keep emphasizing, I don't really participate in this because we talk and we leave and we do nothing. Nothing. There's hundreds of young men out there that can't leave the neighborhood. Not because, because they may get killed. We're just about on the wrap up, but we wanted to have Anthony relate these stories, and they run deeper than that. He and I have been talking about doing a documentary so that the community can see why we have to act now to get these young men and others, because they're coming from middle school, you know. They're coming through middle school. It's coming to a neighborhood near you. And they're being recruited. Yes? So part of the initiative that I've been saying to the tech group is, look, this is the long term. This is macro. We want to do macro, and everybody wants to do macro, but we've got to do the short term. It's about how do we equip our young men and then how do we support it? And there has to be continuity. We go with what's trendy now. But for this, I've seen it firsthand. Chalk and I have been talking for years, and I've seen it escalate. But we can make a difference. For him to come out tonight, and, and what he wanted to do was sit and if there are questions, but I knew that he could come out with what's really plaguing us first. And we've got to deal with it. The tech group 
We're going to move further. We have a few people here. We have um, Leona Bryant, who's doing a program in Belize, and he wants, and he's been to the government, and he said, look, let me take four or five of these young men. We need support, and we will put them to work, take them out of this environment, do as Jock says, let's change their mindset, and bring them back into an environment where they can contribute to society. That is part of the education. But we cannot look at education in this narrow, narrow way. And if we continue to do that, we will continue to see young men fall through the cracks. We want to wrap it up. Colonel, if you would do your bit, we're going to have to then call it there with a wrap up. Um, if you come forward, you've got. Yes. Yes, good to see you. Um, I wanted, I had a question. Were there any women allowed attack women and men? Um, the other question is, how long do you think it will take to set up this new school? How many years? Pardon? Head, okay, anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> It doesn't matter. We, we, we've discussed this also while they're looking. So what's the, how many years? <coughs> it's working, Colleen, let me get to. Stay with us, stay with us. Well, the, the answer to the question, if it is to any women, there weren't any in the, in the day school, but there were women in the night school. Okay. In fact, Stuart Hamer's mother was in my class. Okay. All right, but and the question, the next question. Well, the, the, well, the thing is, uh, in terms of the school, well, the first thing we've got to do is determine what, what the total concept is, um, and whether or not it's going to be done with one school, which, which is fully comprehensive, or whether or not you take it, take it the, the educational uh, requirements for technical education and make it generic to, to the to the whole school. That's, but this question is going to be solved, and whatever the best solution is in terms of the form of the technical institute, many of our questions will be the form is literally just form a school. Um, the, the first thing is going to be, is going to be decided upon. The next thing is going to be you're going to have industry buy-in. You, you don't want to create an arbitrary So an estimate how many years uh, you, before it's up and running? You could be a year or two planning it. So and, and depending on where, where the facility is, you could be another year or so just pulling the facility. So let's, let's say three years, three years would be a, 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 a good, three years a a good guess if anybody was there. Okay, another question um, for the TAC alumni is, um, have any of you actually uh, met with from you know, college technical division? Like had a meeting with them. You know, you know Llewellyn Trot. Pardon? Uh, Llewellyn Trot. I know Llewellyn Trot. Yes. Yeah. Well, actually, a group of tackies mm -hmm. lobbied very hard. To, He's no to, longer to at Bermuda College. Yeah, so but they, right they, they, they got him into. Um, they got him at Bermuda College, and that's and it was Kelsey Smith. There's a number of individuals <coughs> that, were, that were over there, right? But um, the, the position is is that coming to the students that after after the age of 16 years old, 17, 18 years old and then having them to take up woodwork or take up metalwork or take up certain things. It's, it, the horse is already on the stable. And, uh, and all the training and disciplines that, that's on, that will cause you to have a well-rounded, fully, fully balanced uh, uh, individual, you need to start at 11 or 12. So you can put them out at primary school? So From primary school, school onwards. Yeah. What is now the middle school, should be the base of their technical, technical training in a diverse fashion. Okay, I wanted to um, suggest a solution, and my solution is, if anybody's interested in um, tech trade education, they call Bermuda College, because they can do that right now. They can enter Bermuda College, and if they have to get the, um, the paperwork or whatever done, if it's too late for this semester, they can enter in January. 
Um, I took two young men up to Bermuda College two years ago, two years ago who um, were interested in plumbing and um, electrical. And unfortunately, it wasn't any before that Bermuda College, but one of them was on drugs, so he wasn't ready for that step. And the other one, he had a balance, so it never really, his family was supposed to work at all, they didn't work at all in time. But um, I'm just standing because I actually did take the core class, the basic core curriculum class at Bermuda College, and it's not a hard, um, stressful way to get into that um, field. And that everybody that is going into the trades needs to have that international um, core curriculum to start out. And then once they have that, then they decide whether they want to be a middle mechanic or a plumber or air conditioning and refrigeration. Um, but they have to do the core. It's $990 and they can do it in one semester. So I think that's the easiest solution right now for people that are ready. Well, that's another thing I was going to ask the alumni. Have you thought about setting up a uh, TAC alumni scholarship if someone does want to attend Bermuda College? Like, no. And then you can help them pay the $990. Like, like okay. someone said, who has $900? $1,000. The rich ones don't. Yeah, we, we, first of all, and Dell, as, as chairman of our group, would tell you we do have scholarships. Mm -hmm. And at the September 6th event, there will be monies raised to give another scholarship. But let, before you go further, I really need to say this. One of the reasons we're having this meeting is because this isolated college program is not succeeding. All of the speakers have said that. We must get that in our heads. Young man here said we have to start earlier. We must now, one of the guys said revolutionary revolutionize. We must now understand that Bermuda's system for vocational and technical education and going from there is not serving the country. Has anyone determined why it's not, not and, serving and, the country? And, and that's why we are meeting and one of the reasons... Oh, hold up. Hold up. One yeah, but people know that can start there. And, and madam, madam, one of the, we want to say this, look. We have said there are programs going on that are having a degree of success. We cannot look at it narrow, or we're going to lose more than the guys we're losing there. We do not want people to fall through the cracks. We must devise a system that is inclusive. We must devise a system that catches our young men early. We are losing them at middle school. And so, we do not say that we're not going to take on board what the colleges do. Yes? But we're saying that that's not working. You need something for the younger people, not the people that are ready to go into college. Yes, and even that is not holistic. It, 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 it's, you cannot simplify it. We need to go back. What you've heard tonight, we barely scratched the surface on why it turned out so many business people, why it had the author pictures in the company, why it succeeded. Scratch the surface. We got away from it. And we said, let's put something like a band-aid, let's push them all to Bermuda College. With all due respect, Dr. Green and company are doing a great job. It's not holistic. We've examined it. And neither can we give all the solutions tonight. I said on radio, we know the same. The journey of a thousand miles begins with what? One step. Yes, one small step. So this is a small step. Yes? We're explaining some things. This is a small step. Okay. Stay tuned. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. So Lisa, Lisa, one thing I want to just add to that is you're a highly motivated individual. And in fact, when you look around the Bermuda society, you find that women, basically, are, are motivated. The issue is, is, is how do we get the young men motivated to, to step up to the position that you took up and said, I'm going to do so and so. Uh, and this is where we think that before they even begin the choice, yes. um, I think at 11, 12, where they're going to come from elementary school, and you 
introduce them to the basics of everything there at that stage. By the time they're 13 or 14, they've already got it. Yes, and there are some colleagues who are going to be able to go to the college and say, that is not Bermuda's overall solution. We have a massive unemployment problem. It's not going to be one body or the other resolving it or solving it. But we ask you to bear with us. This is a journey. And I said earlier, one of the problems with Bermuda, we like trends and we're not willing to slug it out in the journey. Colonel, we're wrapping it up. Hopefully I can do that for you. Yes, you can. If you don't mind, I try to face my lead. Don't mind at all. In particular, we'll stand next to Mr. Boris because I'm going to make some reference to it. Okay. Oh. Okay. How's that done? You're good. All right. A lot of things have been uh, touched on and covered this evening, and there's a common theme, and that is obviously the need for uh, tactical training to start early. Um, but I think we need to, to broaden our scope because there's, uh, there are conceptual things that uh, a lot of people overlook and things that, that um, obviously fall through the cracks. Um, I said I was right, Mr. Boris. Um, there are two things I can say uh, relating to things that he, he said. First thing is, when he started work. Well, when he started work, a little while before I was uh, ready for work, when he started work, I was probably still using the outhouse with the wooden bench and the hole in it. Right? Now since then, now, I sit down on the public toilet, and if I wiggle, it flushes. Yeah? So there's, a, there's been a quantum leap between what's going on when he started and where we're at now. And in that period, we have three, four, five generations of people who didn't make the leap, right? Even a step at a time. And therein lies our problem. Those of you who, who have been successful, have started jobs and are hiring people, have you had any problems getting people to work effectively? Everybody you hire works 100%? Not likely, right? One of the things that, that, that is, is actually holding us, black, holding us back, and particularly as our, within our black community, is the fact that we are so sensitive to things, period. And unfortunately, we are so politically focused that we think everything has a political answer, has a political result and, and, and benefit. And we're looking to politicians to solve our problems. No. This gentleman spoke about talking to the, to the people. There are two things that, that um, I want to say. One is, in our, 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 my discussions across the defense board table or promotion board table, interviewing people looking for uh, promotion or whatnot, I asked them, what is the single ingredient, most important ingredient, that you need to consider in dealing with your people in order to uh, get them to perform? The answer, really, is motivation. If they don't develop an interest, they ain't going to perform. So the job is to get them wanting to do it, willing to do it, doing it whether they like it or not, because they have to get through it. Well, the guy doesn't want to get out of bed mornings, has to have some motivation for him to do it, get to work, do the job, stay there seven, eight hours, and then he can have that uh, paycheck to do the other nice things that he wants to do. But the concepts, the negative concepts that our kids have been growing up with over the years have been working against us, like a dark cloud, and everybody falls under the, the, the shadow. And it takes uh, some degree of motivation, assistance, opportunity, and God knows what else, and training, training is another thing, to get away from that shadow. 
But motivation and discipline are what's required. And if you don't see it in the, in the uh, um, employee, then you know that you're not getting the, the best out of it, or he's not putting out the best. Okay, the second thing Mr. Boris uh, mentioned, uh, as a top politician, minister, people raised their eyebrows that uh, he was a plumber. Okay, again, concepts. Question is, how come a government minister is a plumber? No. The concept should be, how come a plumber got to be government minister? And I can relate to this because I'm back to, to driving a taxi. I've been a scratch farmer all my life. All right? Nothing fantastic in education. All right? I, I managed four Cambridge uh, uh, passes, and I needed six for a certificate. So I got four out of seven uh, exams that I took. I went out to work at Many Baptist uh, Garage at 14 during the summer, and for my next two or three summers, and, and, and working weekends and whatnot, I was more focused on making money than, than, than studying at school. But after I left school, I went into, into the garage working full time. That's beside the point. In referring to Mr. Boris, I have a similar experience. I went to a cocktail party at Government House one night, and um, after the cocktail party, I jumped in the taxi and started work. There was a call around midnight for the restaurant around the corner, and um, out come these five people who were at the cocktail party at, at, um, at Government House. And they'd been in for, for a conference of sorts. And anyhow, I got them in the car and helped the princess. And, um, so they were going on with their chatter, and then I interrupted. I said, you folks enjoy the party at uh, Government House this evening? They said, be quiet. Were you there? Yes, I, I was there. Did you remember? And the lady was sitting in, in the front seat. I said, did you remember we discussed uh, the uh, friend of mine who has a, a person, has a son working for, is it Microsoft, Larry? Son working for Microsoft, uh, they were in the West Coast, wherever. He said, oh, yeah. Now she's really dumbfounded. Here I am, sipping drinks at Government House, and suddenly I show up driving her back to a hotel. I'm asked very often by well wishers, how come, how come the honorary colonel of the Royal Bermuda Regiment, and if I want to dress it up, I, I can only say that I'm probably the only black honorary colonel of a royal regiment of the British Army, anywhere in the world. Anyhow, the question, how come the army colonel is a taxi driver, is driving a taxi? And I turn it around. How come a taxi driver can become an army colonel? Hey? Okay, what it takes, first of all, is opportunity. I got that opportunity in school. That opportunity was practical application. That's what TAC Institute was. Practical application to workplace subjects. Yeah? The opportunity was uh, fostered by a bit of work. It required a bit of discipline. How to be there on time. How to do this. How to be fit. How to do this. And it went on and on and on. And what I found, what I can look back on, is that all the training that our, our regiment uh, uh, does uh, is very basic and it's practical application at the outset. And we're getting, uh, and that, that, that's the beauty of, beauty of the, the, the uh, prescription system that we've had. We've had him who didn't finish primary school and him who, did, uh, who just came back from, from college and him who is uh, the minister's son and him who is the doctor's son all in the same barrack room, doing the same thing, and after a few days, they all feel equal. Right? And that's just practical application. I, I say to people all the time, you, people complain, no, we do much, too much drill. Okay, you know what drill is? 
materialistic basis of discipline. If you can make yourself stand still for 5, 10, 15 minutes, half an hour, hour it's you making yourself do. But those simple things we've not got into our youngsters for generations. And that's been because, and I don't hesitate to say it, and that's been because, for the most part, our focus has been political. All right? Nothing you can talk about today doesn't get color coded black or white. That's crazy. You've got as much black on black prejudice going as black on, uh, white on black prejudice going. You stop and open your mind and think about it and, and, and eyes. Open your eyes. Not that it isn't a, there, there aren't problems, but how we react to those problems is what's important. Reg Martin is a good friend of mine. When I was in the garage and he was uh, at tech, uh, and then went to Bermuda Motors, and uh, Mr. Henderson, he's got a job painting uh, Henderson's car every year or so. I did the body work, and we'd uh, rub it down and spray it out. One minute, Colonel. Yeah, that's all I need. One minute, I don't know. Um, but the thing is, uh, there, there was hands-on skill and opportunity. And that required a bit of discipline to, make it, to pull it all together and make it work. What we need is to uh, uh, eliminate a lot of those negatives. When the attack was closed and the emphasis was said to be put on hospitality industry, people were saying, not my child, my child ain't going to be nobody's uh, servant. Okay. But conceptually, what work does anybody do that isn't service? So, first thing you've got to plant in these people's, in young people's minds is service is not something that, 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 that's bad. You've got 10 seconds. It's, a, it's something that we all have to do, and we do it whether we like it or not. Thank you very much. I just uh, want to wrap it up with Dal Davis, and I would ask why we wrap up if um, Leon O'Brien will come this way for two secs, if you would. We're going to ask Leon to uh, join us uh, at a tech meeting where he can explain some of the concept that he has um, to take some of our young men off island and help make them productive. Leon, you've been here for a long time, so we don't have time for a speech. Yeah, but it, Del Monte says you can have his minute. But if you could very quickly tell us Belize, and then we say good night. Yeah, I'll be very, very quickly. For many years, we've been looking at opportunities for Bermudians, and we feel that Belize is a great opportunity because of the individual, if we can afford $60 per week, we can send a young person to Belize in education plus boarding for one year. If we eat that, we'll go for university. Why we're spending forty and fifty thousand dollars to send our kids to Canada? But Belize is an English-speaking territory, and one of the things that I wanted to point out: Belize is a great opportunity for us as Bermudians. They need housing projects. They got eight thousand square miles of land. We have the technology. We have the ambition. We have. We can actually take people to get out of this country and make a productive citizen if we would think beyond what we are doing at this particular time. And Belize is welcoming to us. We can stay there for six months. It's so much opportunity, and I don't want to take up the time in that process, but my thing is that for years I've been working on this project, and Belize is our frontier. It's an English-speaking territory. What we need and what we can do and when we can give our opportunities for our young people, it sits there. We have the knowledge, we have the technology, we have everything they need. What we just have to do is think beyond this country, that's all. Well, he, he stuck to the one minute and a bit. Look, we, we thank you very much for joining us tonight, for expressing there's obviously uh, a lot of food for thought. There's obviously 
many things that people would like to see done. Thank you again. Listen out soon for tech folks. We've got tickets here and non-tech uh, tech folks also for the September 6th, where you will hear one of the two remaining teachers, Mr. Kerry, give an incredible interview. Again, thank you for coming out.